The next presenter is Juan Rios from Panama, who will present using digital storytelling as strategic asset in English language acquisition. Mr. Juan Rios Vega holds a BA in English and Education from the University of Panama. Among his numerous degrees, we can mention a Master's of Education in Curriculum and Teaching with emphasis in English as a Second Language, ESL, from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, a National Board Certification in English as a New Language for Early Adolescents through Young Adulthood in, in two, th two, 2009, sorry and a doctorate in philosophy in educational studies. Cultural studies concentration from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. In 2015, he published his first book, Counter Storytelling Narratives of Latino Teenage Boys, From Vergüenza to Echele Ganas. Currently, Ms. Dr. Rios is an associate professor in the Department of Education, Leadership and Counseling at Bradley University. So please give the floor to Mr. Rios. Good afternoon. Can you see it? Yes. Woohoo! This is my lucky day. <laughs> so uh, thank you so very much for having me this afternoon. This is my pleasure. Um, so like as you mentioned, my title is Dr. Rios, uh, but my name is it's Juan. So um, I'm a professor at the University of, uh, sorry, at Bradley University in Peoria, Illinois. Uh, so, and the title of my presentation is Using Digital Storytelling as a Strategic Asset in English Language Acquisition. So um, to begin with, um, I will just tell you a little bit of my story because I think it's important for the audience to have some type of background knowledge about who I am and, and the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. So I was born and raised in Panama, um, pretty close to Costa Rica, by the way, um, pretty close to the Costa Rican border, Panama-Costa Rican border. So um, it's interesting to go to the border because I just took one step and I'm in Costa Rica and then the step back, I'm in Panama. So I'm a, I'm a, I moved to the U.S. in 1999 as a teacher, um, I taught middle school, high school, and college students, mainly in North Carolina, for over 16 years. And then uh, I taught them English as a second language, by the way. And after that, after my studies and all that jazz, I became a professor at Bradley University since 2016. And my role, uh, as it today, is to prepare pre-service teachers, um, especially elementary school teachers and, and content area teachers, middle school and high school, especially those who are getting an ESL endorsement um, as, as an add-on to their uh, main uh, major. And like you mentioned, uh, um, my first book is called Kind of Storytelling Narratives of Latino Teenage Boys um, and how they used uh, um, culture, their culture, the Latinx culture or cultures as a springboard for them to remain in school and to graduate. And then the, the, book, the last book that I recently published it's a children's book. It's a bilingual children's book called Carlos the Fairy Boy. And if anybody has any questions about this book later on, I can answer um, those questions. But um, I just wanted to make sure that you understood where I'm coming from, because I think that um, my positionality, my background is, is very important um, and it's closely related to this topic. I'm a very a passionate, a critical race scholar. I think that's also important. And through my studies, I have been able to, to bring how issues of race, class, gender, social status, um, and also sexuality um, shape the experiences of Latinx students K through 16 within the US. So that's where my passion is. That's what I do besides teaching uh, teachers, um, pre-service teachers uh, at Bradley University in Peoria, Illinois. So I just wanna read this quote to begin with because storytelling, it, kind of similar to what I just did at the beginning, share a little bit of my story. Uh, we are storytelling creatures who use stories to do many essential things like teach practical skills, build communities, entertain ourselves, make peace with the world and cultivate a sense of personal identity. Technologies come and go, but stories are forever. Absolutely. Um, coming from a Spanish speaking background, like, like probably most of the audience here this afternoon, we have been brought up with stories, right? We learn stories from our parents, our grandparents, 
Um, and that's the way they educated us mainly, right? Especially when they use um, what we call in English advice just to teach us how to navigate the world. So we are storytellers by nature because we are brought up with stories or around stories. And those of you who are teachers uh, in practice right now, we have a lot of stories. And the more we teach, the more stories we collect, whether they're our own stories or our students' stories um, as well. So uh, one thing that I want to mention in this presentation is also this idea of digital natives and digital immigrants. And let me tell you, as I was getting ready for this presentation, I was wondering, well, maybe this information is a little bit dated because nowadays we're talking about artificial intelligence, right? But for the sake of this presentation, I would use this um, resource just to kind of like uh, set the tone about digital natives and digital immigrants. So uh, today's uh, students uh, K through college and, and, and represent the first generation to grow with this technology, right? They have spent their entire lives around it and using computers, video games, digital music players, video cams, cell phones, and all the other toys and tools that you can think of, right? Uh, little kids nowadays are given a tablet from day one or they're so used to uh, their cell phones or they have their own cell phones nowadays. So, so I see little toddlers with cell phones that parents purchase them, uh, which is kind of like, uh, it's amazing sometimes to see how kids are learning uh, from day one to use technology. Um, today's average college grad students spend uh, less than 5,000 hours, I would probably say more um, on the computers and also 10,000 hours playing video games not to mention 20,000 hours watching TV. I think students spend more, much more time nowadays using their cell phones uh, than anything else uh, because cell phones are literally small computers, right? Uh, also computer games, emails, Instagram, TikTok. A lot of the students nowadays and people also are TikTokers. Uh, the internet, cell phones, you know, we are surrounded by technology. And as a matter of fact, what we're doing today is using technology, right? I mean, I'm currently in Panama doing a Fulbright and also, and, and the presentation is just next door in Costa Rica and people from all over the world can have access to this presentation today. So we are currently using technology uh, to educate ourselves. So our students today are all native speakers uh, of digital language or computers, video games and the internet. So they understand this language uh, that people probably from my generation are still struggling uh, as we call ourselves, digital immigrants. Also, a digital immigrant instructor who speak uh, an outdated language like, like some of us do, uh, are struggling, right, uh, to teach a population that speaks an entirely different language. Um, and I think something that we struggle with sometimes as teachers is like to, uh, to realize that our students who belong to this uh, new generation uh, using technology are sometimes more uh, advanced or savvy about using technology than, than, than we are in a certain um, certain ways, right? So defining digital storytelling, digital, just to set the tone here again, refers to literally anything associated with the information. Age and story means so many things to so many people that it defines strict definition. So digital, uh, for you to understand a little bit better, digital storytelling uses personal digital technology to combine a number of media into a coherent narrative. And I will unpack this a little bit more in, in a second. But what I want you to understand so far is that digital means anything that is related to technology and storytelling is the ability that we do have to tell stories, right? But in a digital way, using technology. Uh, and again, storytelling is nothing new. It has been used generation after generation. Uh, the only different thing nowadays is that we are including the use of technology, right? So, so why do we use uh, yeah, this in the ESL classroom? What is this so important? Well, English language learners benefit from reinforcement of vocabulary and comes through pictures, graphics, and videos. And, and I want to emphasize here that this is also close related to differentiator instruction and also multiple intelligences. I, for example, um, like to, I'm a visual learner. I like to see pictures. I like to listen to things um, for me to, and also to connect, right? 
So um, if you just talk to me, you just lecture me, it's going to be hard for me to connect until I see something that relates to what you're saying, right? So this uh, use of digital storytelling allows students to reinforce or to learn new vocabulary. Technology also lets students to be able to express themselves. Also, everybody has their own personality, their own um, likes and dislikes, their only way to, to their personal ways to see the world from a different lens. So um, that's what this is also important. Also, technology helps English language learners to find a voice, which helps ease the transition in learning a new language. And this is very important because um, maybe some of you have experienced this in the past, but the older the students get, the more uh, reluctant they are to talk to the new language in, in public, right? Because, you know, teaching pre-adolescents or adolescents um, is, is very hard because because they're adolescents and pre-adolescents. So there's some other agents that kind of like hinder their ability to speak up because they're afraid of what people are going to say or to be bullied, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it also allows students to find a voice because they sometimes they don't have to be seen on the screen. Sometimes they can only use their voice or voices to express um, their feelings, right, or their ideas. It also helps students to learn as much as possible and to demonstrate that knowledge, the knowledge that we need to fully and creatively use what advances in technology have to offer. And again, technology keeps changing overnight. So what was new yesterday is not new today and so on. So, and, and, and students, young students um, are the ones who sometimes update us teachers about what is new out there in, in terms of technology. So digital storytelling, what does that mean? Traditionally, storytelling itself is regarded as the oldest form of education. Like I already mentioned, it's nothing new. We have been telling stories um, from day one. Story Storytelling digitally, not orally, is called digital storytelling, which is a kind of practice using, again, technology, computer, multimedia, assisted tools in order to tell stories to others. Again, bringing technology to uh, this um, type of strategy. In digital stories, there are a set of multimodal, and this is important, aspects and components, including such as visual images, written text, recorded audio narration, sound, music, and video clip segments. This is important to understand here because sometimes students and sometimes um, uh, young adults, um, you know, like the ones I'm, I'm teaching right now, they get confused with PowerPoint presentations. And I tell them, no, this is not a PowerPoint presentation. This is such of a something like a movie. It's, it's um, a project where you are going to be using your voice, but you are also going to be using images, written text, music, barra music. Uh, and sometimes you, you will type some words, but it is so different from... Uh, um, what we already know as a PowerPoint presentation. So just keep that in mind because sometimes students get confused with, oh, this is like a PowerPoint presentation, but it is not. Uh, let's move on. The importance of using digital storytelling to learn English as a foreign language. Um, so in second language learning, digital storytelling can indeed be a good vehicle to increasing language performance in that it has the potential to provide motivation to students by engaging in reflective learning because of the up-to-date ICT technologies and multimedia functions. Now, the storytelling, uh, it, it focuses on many different components, not only language development, but also allows the students to be reflective. It also allows students to use their imagination. It also allows students to use their creativity. It also allows students to increase their self-esteem, um, et cetera, et cetera. In reading and writing sessions, English language learners can have more creative opportunities if provided with sounds, music, graphics, images, and animations, which expand them to express, again, their creativity. Believe it or not, students, uh, if you allow students to use their creativity to develop their projects using digital storytelling, you will be you will be surprised what they can create. And sometimes the more reluctant ones uh, love this type of uh, approach um, and they can surprise us uh, at the very end. Students can share their own stories through digital storytelling in ways 
that in ways other than just plain text. Remember, uh, in the past, we only used like paper and pencil. Uh, they had to write down the stories. Nowadays, they can turn their written documents into a live document by using um, technology. And they can also, again, be more creative. Uh, learners are expected to have more chances for collaboration and cooperation work with each other through digital storytelling, which helps them gain social and cognitive development through such sharing experiences. This is also important, especially when you ask the students to work in groups to develop uh, digital storytelling. Now, there are some there are instances when teachers prefer the students to work individually, which is a different ballgame. But later on during my presentation, I will be sharing some uh, uh, templates that you can use in your classroom to allow students to work uh, in groups to develop this, this type of strategy. Um, but I, in my experience as a professor now at Bradley, uh, my students do this individually, not as a collective, okay? But in schools, since you have more, more, more students, I think it is a win-win to do this as a, as a, as a group project, right? Um, so what are some of the key points behind digital storytelling used in the TESOL context? right? Digital storytelling is a means for both teaching and practicing multimedia literacy, which is something extremely important. And I will also add here teaching not only language, but also content. And I will give you an example in a second, and also developing the language of technology, right? Um, in some countries, um, and I will talk about Panama because that's a country I know the most after you know the US where I have lived for 23 years, um, it is not easy to use multimedia in some spaces because students do not have access to computers or cell phones. So here we have to tweak it a little bit uh, and just to make sure that, that everybody has a chance to use technology. And I can give you some, some of the ideas that I used in the past uh, when I was teaching in North Carolina because I have some students who did not have access to technology. And, and, but I can also give you some tips of how I did this in a, in a different way, but I also allow students to work as a group. Digital storytelling can be tailored to effectively deliver specific content for learning. Again, it could be used in content like science, social studies, history, even math, right? Success with digital storytelling comes solidly from being able to make meaning from experience. And this is when students find connections to what they're learning. Uh, if students cannot connect their learning to their personal experiences, there's no way it is going to be meaningful to them, right? So talking about their own stories is, is easy, right? Because all of us have our own stories, but then when you push them to use content like science or history, now they still have to find some connections with the contents. Um, if English as a foreign language and English as a second language students working with images and text, to create a digital story, develop digital literacy. Now, within the U.S. context, it is embedded in the in the curriculum that students need to develop digital literacy and also media literacy. So maybe in some countries that is also included. If not, I will encourage teachers to do this because you know technology is used almost everywhere. Uh, whether the the Ministry of Education ask teachers to use it or not, I think we as, as responsible educators should include digital literacy and media literacy in our teaching, right? Uh, what type of storytelling exists? I think I already mentioned some of them. Personal narratives, right? Uh, historical things, something that happened in history, uh, let's say World War II, or maybe something that happened in history um, in your own country, Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia. Uh, or stories that inform or instruct, right? Um, we can ask students to teach us how to make, let's say, a cake or how to decorate a Christmas tree, those who celebrate Christmas, or how uh, to do a math problem or how to uh, prepare um, a recipe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They can uh, record the instructions and they can also create images. They can put some background music. They can put some captions, et cetera, et cetera and you're using content and also uh, language uh, development and also, uh, 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 sorry, 
forgot the word, digital uh, technology, right? Oh, literacy, sorry. So reasons why using digital storytelling to enhance language learning, well, it assists to develop several language skills such as reading and writing, when storyboarding, and I will give you an example of storyboarding later, and speaking and listening during collaboration and narration. Now, if you ask the students to do this as a group, you as a teacher, you know, your role changes because you monitor the students, you assess their speaking, you assess their listening, you make sure that they are on board, that they are focused, that everybody has a role where they create the stories, et cetera, et cetera. It also allows students to develop their vocabulary repertoire, which I think is very important, especially if you are, if you ask them to do, uh, use digital storytelling in content area, right? Encourages students to share ideas, collaborate on picture selection, communicate and engage with unique, authentic experiences while working in groups. So again, collaboration. Uh, also, I will include here how students can develop uh, communicative um, skills, uh, which is something important. And also it allows students to, uh, okay, transfers their understandings to words, text, images, and also music. Uh, I will not go over all of these steps because it, this slide is very wordy, but these are the stages that I collected from one of my sources that allows teachers to be more, more uh, focused on how students can learn step by step. I would highly encourage some teachers to use this because students can, you know, you can even um, uh, assess all these different stages until the students finish uh, their product. So stage one, define, collect, and decide. Stage number two, select, import, and create. Um, I will just read a couple of them. Select the content and text to utilize. Import images, videos, and audio into the movie making application. Uh, then stage three, decide, write, and record. Finalize, that's when the students uh, write a script to use for narration. And then when they finalize by saving the digital story as a video file, pay attention to this, as a video file. Uh, and then stage four is when they demonstrate, evaluate, and replicate. Is when they share their stories with their peers, with their colleagues. And then when they also get some feedback, uh, whether it is from their peers and also feedback from us. Um, and I will show you a rubric in a second that I use to give my students some feedback about their, their, their projects. So here I have some uh, um, softwares that teachers can use uh, and ask the students to use as they develop their digital storytelling projects. Um, you, have, you have an Android, these are the ones that you use. You have a computer, for example, you can use iMovie. Um, there are some uh, softwares that you can also encourage students to use, like Animoto, which is a very good one. And this one here with video, these are the this is the one that my students use a lot. It's easy to use, uh, especially if you are a digital immigrant like like myself. Um, there are some there are tons of videos on YouTube that teach you how to use with video. So when I see my students struggling uh, about using te technology or or this this project, I encourage them to watch the uh, videos on YouTube about with video. But uh, iMovie is also very easy to use. Um, and nowadays, man, you know, students use uh, their cell phones to do this as well. So, but honestly, I have never I have not used my cell phone for that one. I still prefer to use my computer. Uh, and this is for to video editing. But again, uh, they can use with video to edit their videos. There is a website also where they can also uh, learn how to edit their, their videos. Um, if your students struggle with this, like some of my students have done, I have to make sure that they understand how to use this. In the past, I, I brought a teacher, a computer teacher that can teach my students how to use technology because some of them get very frustrated when um, they are not doing it correctly. And uh, sometimes I, I scaffold them a little bit more, or sometimes I pair them in groups. There is somebody in the group that knows more technology than others so they can uh, learn from one another, right? Uh, or if not, I have some one-on-one uh, -on -one conferences and help them to create their, uh, their movies. 
And this is also for music resources. Uh, uh, of course, this is what we give students, but you probably have this experience. Students have more, more knowledge about where to find music for free on the internet that, that we do as teachers. At least that's my, my experience, right? So how can you assess this, um, this type of um, project, right? Set clear goals, clear expectations. I would suggest you to show students some samples and some previous students have done. If you had never done this before, um, I will be sharing uh, two presentations um, throughout this, this, this um, lecture, this workshop. Um, You're more than welcome to use them, but you can also Google some digital storytelling presentations uh, on, on YouTube. I've done that before. You can also assess the story. You can also assess all the artifacts students create to develop the digital story, especially the written work. And I think this is crucial because you're teaching students to be more focused, to be more organized. And I think this is an excellent way to grade their process, like five points for this, 10 points for this, three points for this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Assess student planning and process, like I mentioned. Assess media, grammar, and student use of media. Assess student understanding and presentation of content, especially when you use this type of assess assignment to develop content and also language, absolutely. Assess student teamwork and use of resources. Again, especially if you assign each group member a role, you need to evaluate, you need to assess those roles. If they did it right or if they did not, you know, you can discuss that later. Assess their performance when they present their projects, if to see if they follow the guidelines, etc. Provide, this is important, provide narrative as well as specific event-based feedback. Students need feedback from us. And I would suggest that uh, you give them feedback throughout their project and also at the end. Uh, do not wait until the very end to give them feedback because then you would be frustrated and students will be frustrated because they never heard any type of feedback from you while they were working on their projects. Have students self-assess their projects. I think that's also good, but we need to teach students to how they self-assess uh, their own projects. And then have students to add their digital stories to the digital footprints. Also, some students would like to um, post those um, projects on social media. Uh, if this is something that you know is not is nothing bad, it's school related. So I don't I don't see why not. And also remember that students uh, are not. You don't want students to include like personal pictures. Uh, so you have to be careful with that because you have to protect the students. Um, if you do not want, if, if some students decide to, to include, you know, family pictures and stuff like that, I will suggest you not to share that on social media. Just keep it as a classroom assignment. If you as a student do not to include uh, personal pictures, then I don't see a reason why you cannot share that with the, you know, with the internet uh, world. But personal pictures, uh, just be careful. This is my suggestion as a teacher. Um, so I will give you some samples of what I have done in the past um, with digital storytelling. As a former uh, middle school, high school student, I mean, sorry, teacher back in North Carolina. Uh, so this, I created this um, kind of like template because it allowed me to give some type of instruction and to focus on what I wanted the students to use. They had to turn this in uh, after they fill it out. And I gave them some uh, points for this because this allowed my students to, to, to be more focused on what I wanted them to do. So you can see here the image, description, media resources. They have to answer some questions here, et cetera, et cetera. And then the narration goes down here. Uh, then I also encourage them uh, to use story mapping. You probably know about this in the past from previous uh, workshops. Uh, how to use story mapping. Again, this allows students to be more organized. They focus on, 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 you know, on a piece of paper, not so much on the use of technology. Story maps also encourage stories and discourage pure episodic information. I think this is also very important. Um, it also allows students to use their creativity, their imagination. It also allows the students to have conversations among themselves or conversations with you as a teacher. 
Story maps also help solidify the story before production begins, right? Students narrow down their ideas. They can also use um, captions. They can also use uh, drawings, but it allows the students to focus on their projects. Story maps are basically free and easy to create and save a good deal of production time. So I would also encourage you to use story mapping. And um, I also included this here. I think I used this one year with my high school students uh, because sometimes when you tell them to write a story, they are confused about what do you mean by story. And sometimes when what they write doesn't sound like a story. And you know that the story has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And that, as simple as that, just keep reminding students that. Your story must have, even though it is a personal story, it is a personal narrative, it is a personal anecdote, make sure that the story has, again, beginning, middle, and an end. Something simple. And then you can go over this and just explain to them what is it that you mean by, you know, those three uh, parts of the plot, right? And then uh, this one, I like this one. This is more for the little kids, elementary school kids. Uh, they can work uh, with a partner. Um, see the instructions are very simple, right? A 500 word or less created story, include a clear uh, protagonist, antagonist, and conflicts. Easy to use, especially for the kiddos in elementary school. Uh, this one is a poem. I don't know, some of you probably familiar with where I am from, which is a beautiful, beautiful poem. Uh, this is the template. Students have to fill this out. This is an example. Uh, and this is, uh, I used this one one time with my students in high school and it worked out pretty well. And this is the template that I created uh, to uh, assess this story, this poem, right? Uh, this allows students to be very creative because this is a personal story. Basically, they include, in this case, they included personal pictures. But again, I didn't share those with, um, you know, the social media because I need to protect my students' um, vulnerabilities. Um, so I want to switch gears here a little bit and talk to you about what is it that I'm doing right now as a professor um, who is preparing student teachers um, and, the, and using digital storytelling with native speakers because most of my students, or I, I would say all of my students are native speakers of English, but they're still using digital storytelling in a, in a different way they're using digital storytelling here as a reflective tool after they have done their field experience. Uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, my students get an ESL endorsement, which means we send them out in the schools um, for, for 100 hours. They have to work. They have to help English language learners and their teachers. So they spend 100 hours out in the field, but they also get some instruction about how to support how to teach English language learners or multilingual learners, as we call them now, days in the States, right? We're moving away from the ESL term. We're using multilingual learners in order to validate the language or languages that students speak uh, at home uh, or the heritage languages. So I use digital storytelling with my students. At the end of their practicum experience, they have to write a script about story. They just pick one story from one student that have impacted them the most, that made them become more reflective about their future career as teachers. And of course, most of my students do not look like the, the students out in the schools. Most of the students in the schools come from communities of color. For those of you who understand the term color uh, means um, African-American students, Latinx students, Asian students, Native American students. And we also have co uh, co uh, white students. But my students focus on students who are learning English as a new language. So most of my students at Bradley are white students. So they apparently they look very different from each other. They've come from different cultural backgrounds. And sometimes they don't even speak my students language, which is another uh, challenge for uh, a lot of my students at Bradley. But at the end of the semester, when they finish the 100 hours, let me tell you, the experience is, is amazing. What you hear from my students is amazing. So they had to create a project like the ones that I have been talking about towards the end of the semester. So this is um, one of the projects. I don't know if you can 
you will be able to watch this, but let's see how that goes. We can go back and, and try it. Um, so this is what I give them. I'm sorry, the letters here are so tiny, you can hardly see this. But these are the instructions. They have to write an essay that starts with, I believe. It's called, I believe. And they have to pick a, 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 a quote. I believe that education is uh, the key to succeed or is a key to freedom. And then they have to connect that phrase that they pick with a, an experience that they have out in the field. And I usually encourage them to write a story from one of the students, of course. I also ask them to change the student's name to protect their vulnerability, right? But they have to write a story. They have to write uh, uh, the whole plot, what happened with the student, what did they learn from the student, what is their takeaway from the student, and how that experience has allowed them to become better teachers in the future. So they write a script. I grade their, I, I proofread their essays. I push them to develop a story again, beginning, middle, and end. Uh, I try them, I teach them to connect with the, with the, with the I believe in um, uh, sentence that they created. Um, and then they present this at the end of the semester. And that is the end of the semester project. Uh, this one is another one, and but I want to show you this. Uh, I want to show you at least one of them before I finish my presentation. And then I also created a, a rubric to evaluate their digital storytelling project. I also asked them to use this storyboarding. Um, to be honest, at a college level, they don't use it. But those of you who teach middle school, elementary school, and even high school, I think drawing drawing is, is a good way for students to learn language or languages, right? So you see this one here. Um, there is a draft here. There are some pictures that the students drew, etc. Again, my has my college students do not use this, but I also encourage them to use it. Um, so I want to close this here, um, and I don't know why I cannot present the 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 video. Maybe because the way I converted it. Um, And I don't know how to. Okay, so I don't know if they can see. I don't. I have no clue how to do this. People are helping me. Yes. So I don't. I don't know how to. Is there any way for me to show the video from here from my computer? Uh, okay, maybe you can stop sharing the presentation. Okay. And so share let's... your screen. Okay. Uh, okay, let's see. This is a video file. Uh, okay, hold on just a second because I might be able to uh, just... Uh, Okay, something is coming. Okay, it, it posted, it, it, it's uploading, I guess, the video, but. Okay. I believe in showing everyone kindness, regardless of how little or how much you know about them. I believe that everyone deserves to be treated with the same amount of respect and kindness. I believe in showing kindness at all times because you never know how much or how little they may hear it in their day-to-day -day life. I believe that some of the most impactful words in any language are the small ones. <clears throat> Lily was the smallest girl in the class, but she was the loudest. She was the most bubbly and the most energetic one in the room. She wanted and thirsted for attention. She was the first to run up and hug me and the last one to let go. She felt invisible at home, but at school, she was seen. One day, my CT and I walked into the lunchroom to pick the students up and bring them out to recess. Outside, Lily was crying and was hysterical and isolating herself from the rest of the class. My CT approached her to see what was going on, but Lily only got more hysterical. 
She refused to calm down for anyone except for me. So once I stopped what I was doing to attend to her, she started to calm down. When talking with her, I came to find out that she had an accident during lunchtime and she was embarrassed, uncomfortable, and she didn't want anyone else to know what happened. She said she only wanted me to help her because I made her feel safe and loved. She told me that I was one of the only people in the school that she trusts besides my CT because I told her that I love her and I'm always kind to her. We went inside and jumped from the office to the closet with the spare clothes and to the bathroom. I helped her clean up and get into a change of clothes and we sat and talked about why she felt the way she did. She talked about how she knows that the other kids in the class make fun of her, but she loved me because I never made fun of her and I never judged her. She gave me the biggest hug, said thank you over and over again, said she was ready, and then she took my hand and marched back outside with her head raised high. Through my time in this classroom, I have witnessed and I've learned a lot of things. One of the biggest things I've taken away from my experience is that sometimes some of the only positive attention that students receive is from you, and that attention is only present at school within your classroom. Lily tells me how much she loves me and wants to stay at school with me instead of going home, and at first I just assumed that she likes to express her love of school, but after getting to know her, I came to see that the reason it seems like she's saying I love you every five minutes is that she doesn't hear it at home. In fact, she doesn't really hear anything super positive at home, so her light shines brighter when she hears these expressions returned back to her at school. Because of Lily, I believe in showing everyone kindness regardless of how much or how little you know about them. I believe in expressing your love and appreciation for people at any given point in time. I believe that showing kindness and love for people help them shine brighter. And lastly, I believe that some of the most impactful words in any language are the small ones. Okay. So this was the presentation. Were you able to listen to it? Yes, we were able to 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 watch the video and everything. Oh, wonderful! I was kind of worried about it. No, so well, don't worry. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. Uh, let me show. You. Okay, this is the my contact. Um, in case um, you want to get in touch with me later, um, I'll be more than happy to share this PowerPoint um, with everybody who is interested. And if there is any questions or comments, I'll be um, I'm ready to to listen to. Any comments? Mr. Rios, and we will open right now um, the floor for questions. So people, you can write your questions in the chat and we will transfer them to our specialist. While people write their comments or questions in the chat, I already have some comments, so I'm going to read them. Okay. Okay, so we have Gloriela's comment. She says, we're walking experiences and those can become stories for authentic learning. Yes. Absolutely. Then we have Sandra. It says, it is nice. It is nice way to encompass different types of learners and multiple intelligences as well. Yes. Rosa says, I like that idea of a video fil file from a story. Mm -hmm. Rina's comment says, I use story mapping during reading class. Mm -hmm. It helps students improve in their writing and speaking skills. And with the story mapping, you discover if students are able to know, develop a story. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Susie says, great giving out the rubric. Mm -hmm. uh, Rina says, can we have access to, I believe, a digital storytelling project? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, is there a way, like, just by writing to you or? Yeah, you can email me or I can share the PowerPoint with the the organization and you'll be, you know, you can also share that with all the attendees. Um, I don't mind. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm happy to. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then Isaac says, I love this presentation. Reminds me TED presentation. Absolutely. And you never know, you know, it, 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 teachers, we can impact students' lives for good. Um, and you never know how a future public speaker can start just through digital storytelling in the classroom. I mean, we never know. 
We also got another comment that says many attendees are expressing they love the video. Mm. That will be all. Oh, that's good. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, thanks for your presentation and your contribution in this seminar. Thank you so much for having me.